actually one o'clock. Um, so if we can start the meeting. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Liverpool City Combined Authority meeting for the new municipal, new municipal year. Today's meeting is in two parts. Firstly, we have the AGM, and that's a brief, brief adjournment, which is literally two seconds. Um, we'll move on to the business meeting, and so therefore, for the avoidance of doubt, item one to six in the first part of the annual meeting and 7 to 20 in the ordinary business that follows. And as usual with uh, FE's meetings, you've come in here, you've agreed to that the meeting will be broadcast live and your images can subsequently be used um, for sound or filming purposes. And I remind members and officers to ensure that you press the microphone on before speaking and turn it off afterwards. Finally, can you make sure that everyone's phones are switched to silent, please? Okay, so the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. And Jonathan? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. We've had apologies from Edwards Hall, PCC, and from Stephen Young, from Edwards Any further apologies? No. Two is declarations of interest from members, and three is a vote of thanks to retired members in this part of the AGM. Uh, so on behalf of the combined authority, uh, can I offer big thanks to all councillors from all parties who gave, up their, who gave their time up serving the combined authority uh, on many committees. And those committees are integral to the proper functioning of the combined authority in providing some scrutiny of our works and also therefore hopefully going and acting as ambassadors for the wider region. It's a lot of work and commitment, uh, and it often goes unseen. But I know that I speak for everyone here when I say that we bring valued, fair input. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of those people later. Uh, but also, I think it's just an appropriate juncture to pay a tribute to some of the region's fantastic MPs who have recently announced that they'll be retiring when the next general election is called. Uh, so there's Connor, George and Margaret who have been outstanding public servants for the region and strong voices for decades and with lots and lots of experience between them. So we will just uh, note that unless anybody wants to, to add anything. No? Okay, then we'll move on to item four. And it's our first item of business which is to approve amendments to the combined authority constitution. I'll ask uh, Louise Outram our monitoring officer to briefly take us through that report and the changes that have been proposed. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Good afternoon, colleagues. We all know the importance of a constitution to good governance, and so I'm suggesting some changes to you today to the terms of reference of the Transport Committee to reflect the practice that was adopted last year in relation to budgeting, to suggest changes for improved governance for audit and governance for another independent member to be appointed and also changes that have been adopted already for delegated decisions and key decisions retaining those at 250,000. We've also updated on the staffing structure. It's important that you're aware of the, the officers in the organisation and there's, that's attached to an appendix. And there are also changes to reflect the left ceasing to exist as an entity after the 30th of June. There are some additional delegations in relation to Freeport, to the Treasurer, and we're also noting a new legal provision uh, that's been placed upon the combined authority to promote diverse biodiversity. The proposed changes are all contained in 3.3, and I'd be happy to take any questions in relation to these. Okay, any questions on the constitutional changes? Okay, given that changes to our constitution do require a unanimous vote uh, of the command authority. Can I ask that we all agree the recommendations and they're set out in the report on page three? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, item five is uh, an item to note the nominations to the command authority and to approve the appointments of members to our committees for the next year, which is 2023-24. However, there are still a number of outstanding appointments still to resolve. Um, we're going to ask uh, your permission to delegate 
the finalisation of those slots to the monitor officer in consultation with myself. And Appendix 3 is the programme of meetings for this coming year that we agreed at the last meeting. Now we've had some queries about the times of some of those meetings, but we'll ask that each committee considers the timings of those meetings and comes up with a timetable for themselves. I know there was some concern, certainly on Friday afternoons, for instance, it's not the best time to be scheduling meetings. Is that okay? Okay. Um, can we therefore agree the recommendations to set out on page 51? Six is nominations to outside bodies, and it's uh, important for us as a combined authority to ensure that we're connected to the work of other local and regional bodies to make sure we're coordinating our efforts to improve the city region and the wider area. Again, there remain some outstanding appointments to make, but if we can agree to delegate those to the monitoring officer and myself, uh, we'll get those filled in as soon as we possibly can. There are also a number of transport related outside bodies that we're going to invite the transport committee to fill, but they're included in the report for completeness. Is that okay? Can we agree the recommendations set out on page 69 of the report, please? Okay, so given that that was. Um, the annual general meeting and that's concluded, we're now going to seamlessly transition to the ordinary business meeting and we have to go through some of the things that we previously um, have had in the first part but it's for completeness. So for instance, apologies, so we're going to go back to Jonathan with the apologies. Thank you Mr Mayor, yes we've had apologies from everyone's call and see you. Any further apologies? Okay, um, so declarations of interest is item 8 and item 9 are the minutes of the meeting of the command authority which is on the 28th of April 23. Um, can we just uh, agree those as a correct record? Um, item 10 are the middle announcements and, and just to start off um, with really because this is our annual general meeting we have sort of a tradition at these AGMs that we see a bit of turnover of elected members, but this time around uh, we also see a bit of a turnover in officers too. So before we go into some of those mail announcements, I'd like to thank Theresa Grant, uh, who's not here, and Dwayne Johnson, who is here, uh, who's the Chief Executive of Sefton Council, and obviously Theresa was the interim um, Chief Executive of Liverpool. But they're moving on to Passage New, and both who committed an incredible amount of time and effort to serve in our region in the past. So, um, with them both going, we also let, therefore welcome uh, the new Chief Executive of the Pool, Andrew Lewis, who's also with us today. And outside of those officers, uh, it's also uh, a point in which um, Asif Hamid MBE has come to the end of his term and posi uh, position as the chair of the LEP. And so thanks very much to Asif uh, for everything. But Asif's been a, an authentic voice with a, a shrewd business brain um, and has steered the LEP um, incredibly well during some very turbulent times for everybody. Uh, every public sector organisation, I think, needs a wise head, uh, like a thief, who knows how the private sector operates. And um, I think we've all been genuinely grateful for his counsel over the, the next, uh, the last few years. So thanks very much, Steve, for, for everything that you've done. Although it doesn't mean that you're departing just yet, um, but we'll see you around for some time to come. I'd also like to welcome. Um, Councillor Liam Robinson and Councillor Paul Stewart, the new leaders of Liverpool and World Councils, who are taking their seats at the Command Authority, or these particular seats, for the first time today as leaders, and I know they're keen to hit the ground running. Uh, so, 
that means that lastly we need to wish Joanne Anderson all the very best for her future and of course Councillor Jeanette Williamson all the very best and, and Jan as we know uh, led the council for three years but she was also the deputy metro mayor as well and someone we work closely with and especially through that pandemic period she showed leadership and was a very important team player in the combined authority during those difficult months. I just want to very briefly touch on some reflections on Eurovision as well because everything that I do at the moment um, people are mentioning Eurovision not from this area but from outside the area every time I go somewhere I've been to Derby and Leeds twice in the last few days but this is the first meeting since uh, May which of course saw um, the city of Liverpool host the spectacle of Eurovision and it was a week bit longer, about 10 days, wasn't it, of jam-packed fun, laughter, and it has to be said, extravagance, uh, but it showcased the very best of our city and city region on the world stage, and we all knew that, that's why we did support the bid, if you remember, um, but Eurovision has also brought a huge boost to the economy, with figures showing a total increase in city centre football of nearly 400,000 people compared to the same period last year, 400,000 people. And that's an amazing boost for our wonderful small and medium-sized businesses who've really been suffering under the yoke of sore and run costs and online competition. So it's been good for them, not everybody, but for the majority of businesses. But most of all, I think Eurovision was an amazing display of solidarity with our friends in Ukraine um, who really had their moment in the spotlight taken away from them, stolen as a result of Putin's bloody and murderous war. And there were plenty of people who were from Ukraine, but also we had a number of representatives from central government um, at Eurovision, and hopefully they all have gone away with a better understanding of this area. And just to conclude that one, I received some correspondence from the leader of the Labour Party who wrote to me recently to congratulate our area on the show that we put on, uh, saying that Eurovision will live long in the memory and joins a list of events the city has hosted, uh, which he congratulates us for um, and on our enduring commitment to the people of Ukraine. Now, just some of the organisations that were involved in that, I think again we'll list some of them, but if I've missed anybody off, it's not meant to be a slight, but Liverpool City Council, of course, who led in on it. Uh, the BBC, uh, Merseyside Police and, and Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service, the CA, Mersey Rail, bus operators, all of our local authorities and staff and partners who made it such a, a fantastic occasion for everybody who visited us or watched it around the world on television. Now, I mentioned that because I wanted to list the BBC because the production of that event, I mean, I'm not normally a fan of things like Eurovision, but the production qualities were just satisfied. It was amazing what they pulled off. But that shouldn't be at the detriment of other things. And the BBC uh, have a, um, a, a very good track record at supporting local radio until recently. And I have to say, the proposed cuts around local radio services, especially to Radio Merseyside, uh, leave a lot to be desired. For many in our area, Radio Merseyside isn't just a radio station, it's a friend, it's a companion. It, it helps people through periods of loneliness and provides them with news and entertainment. And during the likes of, likes of the pandemic, it was there when people really felt isolated and, and provided that really detailed local news to people and I met some presenters and journalists and um, the production staff on a picket line yesterday and I'll be writing to the Director General of the BBC, um, Tim Davey, to highlight the invaluable contribution that local radio makes to people in areas like ours and I'd like that to be from all of us at the Combined Authority if we've got your agreement to that. Great. Okay, so Eurovision was fantastic, wasn't it? Before that we had uh, the Ancient Grand National, and then after Eurovision we 
we saw uh, the fantastic national con uh, commemorations of the Battle of the Atlantic, um, and this is the 80th anniversary year of that. And there were still a few, but uh, not a huge amount of, of veterans who were still with us and, and attended that. And it was our chance to say perhaps a final thank you to those who are still here and a poignant uh, moment to remember those who aren't. And the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace was here for the official service and I'm proud of the tribute that our area put on once again on behalf of the UK and on behalf of the government but on behalf of everybody in the UK. Uh, I think we live in a free we, we live in freedom because of those sacrifices made in what was the longest battle of the Second World War and we remember all those who laid down their lives in the cause of duty. On the 18th of May I travelled to Wales with the Mary Great Manchester and the Irish Embassy to spend the day with the First Minister and the Welsh Cabinet discussing how the North West can foster even greater collaboration with North Wales on areas and sectors such as clean energy, transport, connectivity, trade, culture, there's all sorts of, of historic links. And Mark Drayford and his team have done a fantastic job to date um, and, and demonstrate the value of devolution. And there's so much more that we, as a devolved administration, albeit with slightly less powers, can learn from uh, them in Wales. And we'll be hoping to, to wrap this up over the next um, few months and years ahead and Councillor Stewart was also uh, there with us and I made uh, a trip also last month to UK Reef where the Combined Authority work and it has to be said very closely hand in glove with all of our local authorities showcased a number of viable and investable projects to the private sector such as Google Strand uh, which featured I believe stuff around those who certainly have heightened town centres centre and will waters that are bank stuff um, and I look forward to ensuring that there's a follow up from those to develop um, further relationships and, and turn those relationships into partnerships. I've just uh, on a, a sort of a quick round robin um, I went to Eureka and I went there with some kids from Seth and Ian um, who were absolutely brilliant. They, they actually won the Christmas card design competition last year and we were from All Saints Catholic Primary School in Bootle. And the kids were just a delight and absolute pleasure. And it was great to arrange that trip. Um, and we went to the Eureka Science Park, which obviously we, we've invested in as well. But it was to try and get the kids and certainly some of the young girls intrigued and interested in STEM and STEAM subjects, you know, the, the world of possibilities for them. But they did love it and I had some of the toughest questions that you can ever get from any interviewer with some of the things they were asking me. Um, but they loved it and it was great to, to, to see um, how something like that might have whetted their appetite for a future career in those areas. I think I probably learned more than needed in all honesty though. On the 19th of May I joined uh, Mike Amesbury and the Chief Executive of Riverside for a walk around Palace Fields and the development there which the CA has put Brownfield land funding into and it's genuinely transformational the development in that area and one that I know from speaking to residents that they're desperate to see and it's fantastic again that uh, that relationship with one of our local authorities and the Housing Association and the CA means that we can start to do these sorts of things. But they explain they've got similar schemes ready to go across the whole country, but because those areas haven't got a devolved agreement with government or they haven't got a combined authority, we can't get them off the ground. And so ours has been used as an exemplar, which is another reason why it made sense for us all to come together as a combined authority all over years ago. And on a similar thing about Brownfield, uh, I joined Council Morgan and Council Tommy Brennan uh, with Live Housing there for any developments. That's also at Brownfield land funding. And 26 new developments. It's alright, there's a fine coming through and that was, I don't mind. That's more for one of your charities because I do collect it and, and send it up. Uh, the 
the 26 new properties that we saw in, in, in development um, are going to sit alongside established housing. But it links the whole thing now and, and makes real sense. And it was great to, to see that blighted land now turned into to viable um, development. In St. Helens, I, I went a few weeks ago to meet uh, Councillor Kate Grouchut at St. Helens Training Centre. Again, got some fantastic work happening on our home doorsteps. And, and we don't sing loud enough about these things, but that's supporting local people into to good and meaningful employment, and that was really good. And then finally, I, I was talking to the leader of Liverpool um, yeah, uh, today, and I visited a new gaming centre, which is also a bar and a restaurant, uh, but it's called Level Tap, and uh, I got invited by the, the owners, but it's a truly immersive experience, and, and stuff, to tell you the truth, that some of it was a, a bit over my head, but apparently they've got a facility where people play games, which are live streams, which people at home watch the live streaming that people play in the game. Anyway, it was it's fascinating. It's garlic bread, it's the future, I'm told. So this is a, it's something that I, I, I just thought that Adam and Callum, who are the two people who put the money into this, and they're talking about this being rolled out right away across the whole country and, and certainly in other areas in the city region. Um, I, I really love them to do well in business because it's quite pioneering and that's what we want here. We want people to, to look to this area of ours and test things out. And then lastly, because I've thanked everybody else, can I thank uh, all our staff as well for everything that they've done? And specifically, those staff who worked um, on the LCRCA Be More Portal, uh, which last night won an award at the prestigious uh, LGC Awards in London. But that follows on from recognition that we received at the International Innovation in Politics Award, which is in Berlin. And I can only tell you that I've had conversations today with some of the Metro Mayors who are quite envious of what we've done on this and looking to see whether they can learn some of the things from our project which we'll happily share. Okay, so that's the end of uh, the item 10. 11 is SIF funding and uh, our new portfolio holder um, is Council of Wharton and so uh, I'll ask him as the holder for economic development and business to take us through that report. Thank you Mr Mayor. This paper sets out the city region's refreshed investment strategy for the strategic investment fund. It identifies clear priorities which have been informed by the combined authorities' plan for prosperity. The first is ensuring continued investment in the four pillars of the city region economy to stimulate economic growth and wider prosperity, our places, our people, innovation and infrastructure. The second is investment in our key clusters of opportunity, including advanced manufacturing, health and life sciences and digital, creative and tech. These clusters will also be reflected in the newly formed business and enterprise boards and city region cluster boards as part of the local enterprise partnership integration process. Thirdly, all projects receiving investment will need to demonstrate their commitment to the city region's inclusive economy and should embed equality, diversity and inclusion ensuring that the city region is a place where no one is left behind. Deliver social value across the city region, helping to tackle some of our most pressing societal challenges and contribute to the city region's commitment to achieving net zero by 2040. Finally, the paper outlines the approval process and requirements of applicants seeking the funding in line with the LCR insurance framework. It also emphasises the importance of the combined authority supporting projects where there is a clear market failure, outlining this through a set of guided operational and financial principles. And I move those recommendations, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 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 Twelve is uh, the socio-economic duty which aims to deliver better outcomes for people who are 
experience, socioeconomic with disadvantage by placing uh, and tackling inequality at the heart of our decision making. And uh, Liz Dean, who's our executive director of the corporate development and delivery, is going to provide a little bit more detail. Liz. Thanks, so, um, as the mayor's mentioned, we are to reduce the inequalities associated with the economic disadvantage such as employment, education, health, housing or crime rates. I think we all accept this specific imperative within the Liverpool City region, which despite making significant progress over the past decade, still faces significant economic and social challenges made worse of course by the global pandemic and the impact of living crisis. Um, as outlined um, in the report, the city region um, has been working together, so that's a combined authority with its six constituent local authorities, Merseyside Fire and Rescue, who have taken an important role in this work, Merseyside Police and NHS partners. Uh, to consider how we can collaborate to adopt and operationalise the basic economic duty. An expertise has also been sought from organisations and local authorities which have already adopted and um, embedded the duty. And we've been working at the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, we've been working in Scotland, so this, the social economic duty is actually um, a requirement in Scotland and where well, this developed nations, it's not actually currently um, a requirement, it's, it's a voluntary uh, action that we take. And I think it's fair to say that there has been some great collaboration and all partners understand the importance, but we are all at different stages. So within the report, it outlines um, within the action plan as well the five key themes of how we would look to take it forward so that we can all move together at a different level. The intention is that we will work as a city region collaboratively to implement the action plan over the next six months through a, a range of existing officer forums. And of course, the more collaboratively we can work, the more impact we can have across our city region and become a leader in this space. So I'll pause there. On that, are there any questions for this? Okay, again, really good news for us. I mean, there are local authorities across England who are looking to adopt this, but we can once again be pioneers in, in, in this sort of um, field. And uh, it, it, it is, of course, in actually collaboration, as I said, with our partners, certainly uh, with our local authorities, but also. Ms. Fire and Rescue, Ms. Police, our NHS. Um, so it's pulling it all together and making coherence of, of what's happening outside. If there are any questions for Liz, can we agree the recommendations? And they're on page 133. Thank you, Now, in a similar vein to 1213, is a Liverpool City Regional Provider Authority uh, report, which is about Committing us to maximise social value to create the best possible outcomes for the 1.6 million people that we have across the city region. And by maximising that social value, we can create more high quality local employment opportunities. We can support people um, ex experiencing inequality and certainly deprivation. We can improve health and well being outcomes, and we can support our net zero ambitions. Um, so, again, this is one for Liz, who's going to take us through, through the report. Thanks, Mary Rodman. So, as members of the combined authority will be aware, we've, um, we've published our social value framework in Liverpool last year. And the framework outlines our commitment to embed social value across our three key roles of responsibility. And they are, of course, as an employer, as an organisation that develops powers, and as a civic leader. And the framework committed us to reporting our progress and impact annually in order to hold ourselves to account. And this is the, the, the report that we've got in front of you for publication today is that first report um, following the launch of the framework. So the report outlines the social value of impact we have delivered over the past year and how this supports our ambitions to create a fairer, cleaner, stronger city region and the ones left behind. We're eager not only to demonstrate the impact we are having, but also to bring social value to life. And to do this report showcases stories of how we are delivering social value in practice. And just to, to highlight a few examples from the report. So, um, the development of the new Hedgehog Lane Station in Kirby, which has identified opportunities to create social value and leave legacy for local residents, businesses and charities.
professors, which includes the Bath and Employment, for local residents, hosting career development, engaging sessions in local schools, building the community ecotherapy garden in the grounds of the local station, delivering sector based work academy for local residents, and implementing a recycle and reuse partnership with local schools collecting the materials, just to name a few. And also, just another example, so social value is also part of our adult education budget commissioning. And in the last two ac academic years, our aim of decommissioning the activities have delivered over 14,000 hours of volunteering, donations in kind, and of resources and equipment to local charities, food banks, and community organisations, improved signposting mechanisms for learners to access mental health and wellbeing services. And then within the report, you've also got some just general examples of how we're delivering social value, so um, reconditioning and donating devices to community groups and employment and skills times and providing access to mental health uh, and exposure training to employees and volunteers. Um, of course, as you've just heard from Councillor Walton this afternoon, um, in the year investment and fresh investment strategy, social value is embedded as a core part of, of that strategy and insurance framework and this will support us to ensure all projects contribute towards our social value ambitions as a key project to make a difference. Thanks, Liz. I mean, some clear examples of how we can extract as much social value out of something, uh, whereas beforehand perhaps um, that would have been lost to us. Are there any questions for Liz? No? Okay. Uh, the... Oh, okay. Councillor Thomas, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's not a question, it's just a a compliment really. I'd just like to commend Combined Authority's commitment to build a workforce which reflects the diversity and wealth of skills across our city region. I'm also elated to see that the Positive Action Programme aims to increase diversity within our workforce, to improve inclusivity within our recruitment practices and to tackle and champion underrepresentation within the organisation. Along with that, the enactment of the Disability Confident Employer certificate level, the importance of understanding um, the people with disabilities and removing barriers for people with disabilities. And it's with a heartfelt thanks as a disabled counsellor to everyone in the combined authority who works hard to bring about positive and proactive change for the lives of so many people with disabilities and health conditions. Thanks, Councillor Thomas. Um, um, and I'll of course pass those thanks on to the team. Um, I think in terms of workforce diversity, it's absolutely clear, but one of the things that we're looking at as a combined authority, again, working in collaboration with all our local authority partners, um, to look at a range of interventions to ensure that we can be that representative um, organisation within our workforce community to serve, and we will continue to be priority for the community. Yeah, thanks for that contribution. I obviously associate myself with every single word that you said in the spirit uh, of the way in which we are trying to tackle some of those social ills. Okay, if we're okay with that, can we agree the recommendations to set out on page one, four, five, please? 14 is uh, a fairly straightforward um, item. It's uh, that we have been told to expect funding of £420,000 from the Department of Business and Trade to support the LCR growth company to deliver the growth hub um, over the next period. Are there any questions on whether we should or shouldn't accept that funding? No? Okay, can we agree the recommendations then on page 175? Um, 15 then is a joint report um, by the portfolio holders for net zero and air quality and for housing and spatial development. So I think Councillor Baines is going to kick us off and then Councillor Morgan can add anything after Councillor Baines. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce this report and say a few words about the Low Carbon Skills Fund uh, section of it before handing to Councillor Morgan to take us through the sustainable warmth fund section of the paper. The Low Carbon Skills Fund provides funding to help us support development of decarbonisation plans for public buildings. The funding can be used to appoint energy specialists to survey public buildings and provide guidance on the types of work needed to decarbonise, ranging from insulation to new energy systems that are low carbon. Last year, as a combined authority, we were successful in securing funding to develop decarbonisation plans for 
851 public buildings across our city region. And in March, we submitted a larger bid for almost £850,000 to develop decarbonisation plans for a further 72 public buildings in our city. The paper before us is seeking advance approval to accept the funding if successful and to ensure the appropriate delegations are in place so that quick progress is made after the announcement of the bid outcome we can expect at the end of this month. And I'll hand over now to Councillor Robin. Thank you, David. Colleagues, I'm pleased to welcome this update which shows our work to reduce carbon emissions across the Liverpool City region while supporting local households against rising energy costs. We know that our retrofit programmes are already making a difference. To date, we've now supported 2,400 households and our partnership approach to local delivery means that, together, we'll be able to achieve much more in the future. Today's report confirms an overall investment of £2.5 million in additional funding from the Government as a result of our hard work and our commitment to tackling fuel poverty and improving health outcomes across the city region. I'm also pleased to say the Government has listened to us regarding the design of this national scheme. We need to be allowed to scope to maximise this additional investment for our local people. Time and time again, this city region is demonstrating what the evolution looks like in action. This is yet another example. So thank you, colleagues, and I'm pleased to move the recommendation into the report. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Any questions? Um, again, as Councillor Morgan said, it's a clear demonstration, isn't it, of, of what we're able to do by working collaboratively and uh, attracting those additional funding pots. And as we demonstrate our um, history of excellent delivery, we're able to mop up more and more underspenders around the country, and that's why these things are really important to us. It's not just the initial pot of money that we get, but it's the potential to receive further awards in the future, and this is one such area that we've been demonstrably successful in. Um, so 123 public buildings, brilliant, thousands of homes already and many, many more thousands in the future uh, and this helps alongside the other things that we're doing to tackle the existential threat of the climate emergency and to, to achieve those net zero carbon ambitions of ours for 2040. So it's all part of a much wider strategy and you can see it all starts to fit together but this is something else to be celebrated I think and uh, if there are no questions on decarbonisation uh, can we approve the recommendations and they're on page 179 and 180. We do have some changes to previously approved SIF projects and uh, they will uh, again fall under the portfolio holder for economic development and business which is Councillor Walton, so over to you. Thank you Mr Mayor. In line with our constitution, material changes to projects require our consideration and there are four main changes to report. The first relates to the access to Halsnead Garden Village, and this change request seeks an extension of time for completion of the access to Halsnead Garden Village project to the 31st December 2025. To date, we have invested £12 million in this project to make improvements to seven existing junctions. This will unlock significant economic benefits by ensuring the Garden Village is viable and attractive for development, thereby accelerating delivery. The scheme focuses on ensuring adequate capacity and resilience of the existing surrounding highway network and improving access to the site. Six junctions have been completed to date, and this extensive time is required to complete the remaining junctions due to challenges faced by the project, including significant delays to the approval of the National Highways for the M62 Junction 6 Tarbuck Island. The second change relates to the St. Helens Southern Gateway, and this change request seeks an extension of time for the completion of the St. Helens Southern Gateway project delivered by emerging travel to the 31st December, sorry, 31st of January 2024. To date, we have invested £10 million of the Transforming Cities Fund to demolish the existing Lee Green Station building and replace it with a new station building and additional facilities, including the expansion of the car park from 196 spaces to 439 spaces. This extension of time is required following delays to the design and planning process resulting in a later than expected start on site. The 
third change is to the City Region Strategic Cycling and Walking Network, which is the Work Package 7. This change requests a reduction in outputs and funding to the network delivered by Will Council. The CA approved £4.8 million of the Transforming Cities Fund to deliver seven work packages. The project will deliver 2.3 kilometres of new improved walking and cycling infrastructure with four phases consisting of Birkenhead Road, Price Street, North Bank Dock Road and Bidston Moss. Birkenhead Road and Price Street went out to public consultation and a high volume of objections were received with Birkenhead Road. This scheme was referred to Will's Economy and Regeneration and Housing Committee where it recommended an extension of time to consider other design options. Therefore, it was not possible to deliver this scheme within the funding deadline. Following the revised programme for delivery of Price Street, it is no longer possible to deliver this phase within a funding deadline due to time constraints. The total output is reduced from 2.3 kilometres to 869 metres. As a result of the removal of the two phases, the funding allocated will be reduced from £1.4 million to £154,246. Finally, the Sector Resilience Programme change request. This change request seeks an extension of time for the completion of the digital inclusion element of the Sector Resilience Programme delivered by community foundations for Lancashire and Merseyside from 30th of June to 30th of April 2024. The other two elements of the programme, Wellbeing and Mental Health Fund and the Community Wealth Building Fund, have progressed as planned. This extension to time is required for the digital inclusion element as the digital inclusion element of the UK Share Prosperity Fund was prioritised before this funding given the tight deadlines the UK Share Prosperity Fund was spent. And I'm commending the recommendations in the report tonight. Thank you, Councillor Walton, for um, the clarity on some of those uh, projects and issues. Any queries, questions, concerns? No? Okay. Uh, those recommendations are set out on page 189. Can they be agreed? 17 is a report, um, which is our last one, uh, uh, as it's uh, an annual report on the policies and strategies that we've approved in the last 12 months, as well as a look forward to some of the policies that we're hoping to bring forward during this particular year. It's a useful reminder of the breadth of the activity of the command authority and some of the important work that we're doing. And the report was prepared before I announced the changes to the CA portfolios. So following this meeting, the information that is set out in the diagram at Appendix 1 will be revised to reflect the new portfolios. Um, but just, does anybody have any issues or any questions on that part of the report? If they don't, um, can we note that report please? Uh, item 18.